Hey guys, welcome to my channel and in this video I'll be talking about containerization and Docker. Containers are the new hot topic in the ever-changing world of IT and I'm sure you'll hear about it if not already. In this video I'll take you through the important concepts you must know to understand containers and will also provide a brief history and introduction to Docker. Now many people address containers as lightweight virtual machines and at first glance it does look and feel a lot like virtual machine. However, they are anything but that. Even though both virtual machines and containers provide us the feel of abstraction over the underlying hardware, they both differ vastly in their working, features, scope and the level where they function in the stack. Hence, it is not advisable to compare virtual machines and containers with the same lens, since that might lead to wrong assumptions. Understanding containers requires a totally new approach and that is what we are going to do now. So for now, we will suppress our temptation to start with the comparison and rather understand the containers first. Then later we can conclude for ourselves on how they are different from virtual machines. In simple terms, containers are nothing but customized isolated processes running inside your OS. They are no different than any other OS process in the way OS treats them as they share the same kernel. Container processes use existing kernel features to create an isolated runtime environment. It is important to note that these features already exist in almost all new Linux kernels and applications like Docker only facilitate the creation and management of such isolated processes. Now the Linux kernel code does not directly provide provisions to implement containers. However, they can be built using a combination of kernel features which we will discuss next. The first idea of containers and process isolation came with the chroot system call that was introduced during the development of version 7 Unix in 1979. A CH root on a Unix or Linux based operating system is an operation that changes the apparent root directory of a process and its children. This was the first apparent demonstration of primitive process isolation within an operating system. Now in this demo, I have my Linux machine which is running a CentOS 7 OS. Let me open two terminals to demonstrate how CH root works. Now on the first terminal, I am inside my directory slash temp slash jail. On the second terminal, I am in the root directory and have listed all the directories in it. Here, I am planning to make the slash temp slash jail as the root directory for a new bash process that I will launch. Now under this directory, I have created three more directories, bin, lib64 and lib. I have also created files just to mark our actual position. One inside the jail directory and the other in the actual system root directory. Inside the jail bin directory, I have copied the binaries for basic Linux commands like bash, ls and cd. Since once I change the root directory for my process, I won't be able to access the actual bin directory. I have also copied the supporting libraries required beforehand. Now let us launch a new bash process using chroot. chroot, the directory path and the process. And there you go. Our new bash shell is launched, however, something is changed. If you notice, when I do a listing of my root directory, I am actually inside the jail directory. This is not the actual root directory of the system, which you can see on the second terminal here. Using chroot, we have changed the root directory for the new bash process we launched. This creates a simulation of a root directory for a process and its children using a system non-root directory. Now chroot alone is not enough when it comes to total process isolation as it just modifies the path name lookups for the process and its children. However, it was one of the first demonstration of the idea of containerization and process isolation. As one of the lead Docker developer famously put it, today containers are basically chroot on steroids. Now over the years, Unix and Linux systems developed many new features to build upon this idea and created various models of containers until finally in 2008, we had the LXC, which is short for Linux containers. Docker was built upon LXC and released in 2013, which became the most successful model till date to create, monitor and manage containers. Now LXC and Docker built containers based on two very important feature of the kernel, namely C groups and namespaces, which we will be discussing next. Now the Linux kernel feature C groups or control groups allows you to limit resources such as CPU, system memory, network bandwidth or a combination of these 
among user-defined hierarchical groups of processes running on a system. Traditionally, all processes in an OS were allocated similar amounts of system resources that can then be modulated by an administrator using the process nice value. Here, in the top output, the NI column represents the nice value of each process. However, in this approach, applications that had more processes tend to receive more resources than the applications that had less processes, irrespective of the application importance. Now, C groups use a different approach. With C groups, you can create hierarchical group structures where each individual node represents a process. Separate hierarchy structures are created for individual resource controllers like CPU, memory, etc. These resource controllers are also called as subsystems in Red Hat machines. Nodes inside each group inherit the attributes of their parent groups and the resources used by each process is charged from the parent group resource quota. With Red Hat 7, the C group hierarchies are binded with the system D unit tree. Hence, C groups are also called as system units in Red Hat 7. Now on my system, I'm running two Docker containers. So let us view the C group hierarchy for say the CPU subsystem using the command systemd cgls cpu. Here you can see Docker has created two subgroups for our two containers. Now all the processes under this container will belong to the same container C group or the system unit. My first container is running one process under it while my other container is running two processes under it. Hence, it is easy to control resource limits by putting resource restriction to the container subgroup instead of controlling it at individual processes. Similarly, we can also view the C group subsystem for memory. The list of subsystems mounted on your system for Red Hat 7 can be found in the file slash proc slash C groups. Now, C groups was about limiting what your processes use whereas namespaces are about limiting what your processes see. Namespaces are used by process to see and identify system resources. So by manipulating namespaces, you can restrict what a process can or cannot see on your system. This feature is key to containerization applications like Docker to simulate an isolated runtime environment. As of version 3.12, Linux supports six namespaces, namely IPC, MNT, NET, PID, User, and UTS. The namespaces for each process to join is specified under the directory slash proc the PID number slash ns. Note that a namespace will get destroyed when the last process in that namespace exists. Now let us discuss these namespaces one by one in a little more detail. PID or process ID is used to uniquely identify a process within that namespace. Multiple PID namespaces can be nested in such a way that the process will have unique PID in each of the namespaces starting from its current namespace. Now we all know the first PID on any Linux system is reserved for systemd or init process. However, nested PID namespaces can have other processes with PID1 which is separate from the system PID namespace. Here I am running a container inside my base CentOS 7 system. Now, in my container, I have launched two processes. First, the bash process and then launch a child process, top. Note that the bash process has a PID 1 and its child process, top, has a PID 95. Now, these PIDs have their scope limited to this container only. Let us see these processes from my base system. On my base OS, if I execute the command ps-ef, there you go, we can see our container processes. However, they show PIDs of 1194 and 7826 respectively. This shows how nested namespaces work. Just to add to that, namespaces enable us to wrap a global system resource such that for a process within that namespace, it appears that they have their own isolated instance of the said resource. Let us now briefly discuss the other namespaces. NET or network namespace is used to virtualize and identify network resources on the system. Each network namespace that you create will have a private set of IP address, its own routing table and other network related resources. 
Now you can create virtual network interfaces VETH. These virtual interfaces come in pairs which behaves just like a crossover cable so that you can use them to connect a namespace to the outside. In default use cases, multiple virtual interfaces from different namespaces can be connected to a virtual bridge on the host machine where the physical interface exists. On my CentOS host machine, I'm currently running two Docker containers. Now if I list all the interfaces here, you can see the two virtual interface peers for the two containers. Now the other side of these peers would be on the container which you cannot see here. Now these peers are connected to the Docker bridge Docker 0. This bridging enables containers to access each other and the outside world through the host physical interfaces. Now we will leave the details for later videos since this is just to provide you all a brief overview. MNT or mount namespace provides isolation of the list of mount points seen by the process. Processes inside different namespaces see different mount points, which also totally alters their view of the file system hierarchy, just like chroot. Note that when using MNT namespaces, commands like mount and umount no longer have global consequence, but will only affect the particular namespace they are executed in. IPC is used to isolate certain inter-process communication or IPC resources, such as system v IPC objects and message queues. The UTS namespace is simply used to isolate system identifiers for host name. And finally, the UID or user ID namespace provides user and privilege segregation across multiple containers. Just like the PID namespace, user namespaces are nested. This allows us to map an unprivileged system user to a privileged root user inside your container. This ensures security as even if the privileged user inside your container somehow breaks out, his privileges won't exist outside the container. On my system, I have configured my containers to be launched as unprivileged system user. Hence, even though on my container I have root access and I can launch processes as root, from outside, these processes are launched with an unprivileged user ID. This, however, does create some complications, especially if your container needs to access certain resources on your host. Hence, do perform necessary testings before implementing this. Now, to create a container, you can launch a process using one or more such namespaces and group them in control groups to get an isolated runtime environment. Now, different configurations of containers can cherry pick one or more of these features that define the level of isolation for them. Usually, the more the isolation, the more your flexibility is limited for direct access to OS resources outside the containers, but then it increases the security. Now, creating such containers from scratch is easier said than done, as it requires some rigorous configuration and testing. This is where applications like Docker come into picture that streamline the whole process of containerization and save us the nightmare of writing hundreds of lines of codes or shell scripts every time you want to create or modify a container. On my CentOS 7 machine, I have already installed Docker. Now to launch a container, I can simply execute a one line command. Docker container run hyphen IT for interactive terminal will use the CentOS 7 image, execute the command bin bash. And there you go, we are inside the container, it is that easy. Similarly, you can launch containers for any application you want using its Docker image, about which we will discuss in some other video. On a side note, there are many types of container runtimes available, not all of which are based on C groups and namespaces. Some of them use completely different approach. Now without going into much details, I will just list some of the well-known container runtimes classified on whether they are based on C groups and namespaces or not. Now that we have gained some good insights into the concepts and working of containers, I think it is safe for us to now try and compare containers with virtual machines. Most of us already know the basics of virtualization. It starts with the hardware layer, on top of which we have the hypervisor. The hypervisor is responsible to abstract the underlying hardware resources and provide them as multiplexed units to its upper layers. This allows us to install multiple operating system kernels on top of the hypervisor, also called as virtual machines. Next, 
you need to install libraries and application dependencies on the VMs. And then finally, we run our apps on the VMs. Now let us compare the stack using containers. Again, it starts with the same hardware layer. Now instead of hypervisor, we have the Linux kernel. Now the kernel runs a containerization daemon like Docker. This daemon enables creation of containers or isolated runtime environments. Each container can have its own set of libraries and dependencies. And then finally, each container can run separate apps in isolation with each other. Now the differences are quite obvious. Most notably, unlike the hypervisor, containerization engines do not form an abstraction layer in the stack, but runs just as a daemon on the same kernel as the containers. The abstraction of hardware resources is managed by the kernel itself. The function of the Docker daemon is to only create, monitor and manage these containers using kernel features. It is more of a container management interface rather than an abstraction layer. Containerization provides huge flexibility and efficiency in the way you manage your infrastructure and is currently the hottest technology in the industry. Containers are extremely lightweight and running them is less resource intensive compared to VMs. However, that doesn't mean containers can completely take over virtualization today. Both of these technologies have specific use cases, especially around the topic of security and data management. Some experts do suggest that using containers along with virtualization provides even better advantages. As we discussed before, the concept of containers is not new. However, it required the emergence of Docker to really pull it into the mainstream of application development. Today, almost all big IT companies are investing to develop and integrate their technologies around the container concept. Now, Docker is relatively new and a lot of its features are still under development. However, with these trends, one thing is for sure, Docker and containers are here to stay. That is all for today's session. Stay tuned for more such videos and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. See you next time.